Next, please welcome Jose Andres, chef and owner of the Think Food Group and Mini Bar. Here with Rachel Martin, host of NPR's Morning Edition and Up First. Well, you guys don't know how lucky you are for so many reasons. Do you know how lucky you are? I'm, I'm going to tell you how lucky you are. I'm with you, you on this stage. So. Um, well, thank you for that. It's a charming man, which is why you're lucky, but you're also lucky because something exciting is going to happen. Our conversation, which no doubt will be exciting, but also let me alert you to the fact that at exactly 2.18, President Trump, in the form of the federal government, will be sending a test of the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> now, it is no secret that you, Chef, have had some tension with the president. Um, I don't know if this is a message he is sending from, from the beyond in some way, well, some subliminal message. I mean, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I made that happen. <laughs> uh, I've been for more than one year trying to meet with people at FEMA, <laughs> and I guess they don't understand my English. And finally, they are sending a message while we are here to prove that finally they spoke to me. So this is a living proof for them that they are actually listening, I guess. So anyway, so, this will happen, we will let it happen, and then we waiting. will continue. I but want my extra like. minute, please. That's right. We're going to try. We're going to demand our extra yeah. minute that the federal government takes away from us. Um, but in all seriousness, we are, we are speaking at a, at a profound time, really. I mean, the Atlantic plans this thing around the same time every year. This year, it happens to coincide uh, with the year anniversary. It's such a strange word, anniversary. But we mark one year since the hurricane ravaged many parts of the Caribbean, but, but in particular, Puerto Rico. And you, Chef, have been so instrumental from the very early days in building a grassroots movement um, to feed people, just to get them food. Yeah. So I did kind of want to take a step back and just ask you what it was like when you got on the plane, one of the very first planes, into San Juan after the storm and what you saw when you got there. Well, I was in, in earthquakes and hurricanes before, but it was like nothing I've ever seen. Uh, was no electricity, was no ATMs functioning. Uh, uh, the supermarkets had long lines of people will be waiting forever because the markets were empty and nobody was going to be bringing any food anytime soon. Um, so I realized very quickly that uh, the problem was very big and that actually in what we know a little bit about chefs, about feeding, I saw that was no plan. And that's why we began cooking. We went from one kitchen to almost 26, from 1,000 meals the first day to almost 150,000 meals a day. We went from 20 friends that gathered together to feed the few to more than 25,000 men and women of Puerto Rico that made it happen. Almost we served four million meals, and I'm glad we did it. We didn't plan, we didn't meet. We do what chefs know. We gather, we find the kitchen, we find the food, and we began feeding anybody that is hungry. Sometimes in emergencies, you have to stop planning. You have to start doing, because the emergency of now when people are hungry and thirsty cannot wait. You, you worked in Haiti after the earthquake there. You have been to many disaster zones. So you know that distribution, it's one thing if you get, you get the people and you're making the ham and cheese sandwiches and you've got an assembly line going. How do you get that food to the people who are living in places where the roads have been totally wiped out? I mean, how did you do that? Well, we did it with the help of many. The community came like, like in an amazing way to join us. So, Everybody became like an Uber driver for us. <laughs> Anybody that had four wheels and the willingness to make it happen, we will give them a sticker, and they became our angels to deliver food. We got more than 10 food trucks that will be delivering the food in the very poor neighborhoods one hour distance from our main kitchen in San Juan. The great thing we did, and you mentioned distribution, is last month we found that there was a million gallons of water sitting in the airport somewhere in Puerto Rico, a million gallons, almost $20 million worth of, 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 of water. 
you can bring the assets, you can bring the food, whatever you bring to help people. If you don't have a good distribution system that is organized and systematic, you can claim, hey, we send them the food, but if the food is sitting somewhere in a place that nobody has access to, equals you are not helping. What we did is, every piece of fruit, every bottle of water, every meal we made, we had a very good distribution system. At one point in one day, we were able to reach 900 points of distribution around the island. That's what we really did. We didn't cook. What we were able is make sure that we brought that food to every corner in the island where people, elderly especially, were hungry and waiting for a plate of food. What was your coordination? I, I, I'm not feeding you, so don't clap. There's no food after my talk. Thank you. What was your relationship with the federal government? Were they helping? Were they hindering? Was Listen, it just the, the men and women no? of the federal government are, are the best people we can have. They work long hours. Sometimes they don't look at the clock. They are 24-7 taking care. But that they're great doesn't mean the system helps them be efficient. The system helps to help. I am the best Republican right now. Why? Because I want, in this moment, no red tape. Mr. Trump, I agree with you. I don't want any red tape. If the red tape makes American people go hungry and thirsty for long periods of time. So now is the perfect moment to say to FEMA, what do we have to do to reinvent a FEMA where the word em emergency means something? In terms of food and water, if you are not able to deliver immediately when there is need, you are failing the American people. So we need to reinvent the lessons learned from Maria that somehow they were applying in North Carolina to make sure that Katrina, that everybody said will never happen again. Well, Maria happened and we were not ready. We need to learn to be ready. There was a, there was a long dispute over the death toll in this hurricane. I mean, the, the government in Puerto Rico pegged it at 64, I think was the number, 63, 64, and it stuck there since last Six, December. 16th when President Trump was first time on the island. Just in August, the government amended that number to closer to 3,000 dead yep. in the first six months after the hurricane. Uh, President Trump just recently said that, despite that death toll, that the federal response to the hurricane in Puerto Rico was an unsung unsung success, yeah. uh, if granted five minutes of the president's time, yeah. what would you like to convey to him about what happened? Uh, I need a minute. And <laughs> and <laughs> what? Leadership, 51% is empathy. If you don't show empathy, you cannot be a leader. <laughs> you can be right and you can be left. The number? Offshore was 3,000 death, probably more. Offshore, they were not on the hands of President Trump directly. We cannot do anything about the hurricane. But yes, the lack of response, the emergency of now, because people were lacking electricity and they didn't have generators. People were dying because they were on breathing machines. People were dying because they didn't have enough water to drink. I saw it that firsthand, they were drinking for from dirty streams of water. And so sure, it's his responsibility to make sure that the death toll will be as little as possible. If you follow Indonesia, unfortunately, it's been another earthquake. We have World Central Kitchen, we have a team there. We're about to be sending a second team. They almost update the death toll daily. If a country like Indonesia updates the death toll daily, Will you agree with me, Republican or Democrats, that we should be able to be updating in America today the death toll daily? By not doing that, we failed the people of Puerto Rico because it seems the problem was not as big as it was. By keeping the real number away from everybody, from the Congress, from senators, from congressmen, from everybody, we somehow said, well, Puerto Rico is not such a big deal, when actually it was a big deal we needed to put the full force of the federal government. And by not recognizing the number, the death toll early, is why the federal aid was not as good and as quick and as fast as was supposed mm -hmm. to be. You have spent so much time outside of the United States and in places that have seen such 
devastation. Uh, Guatemala, we mentioned Haiti, obviously Puerto Rico. I wonder if you could talk about how that experience, looking at America from the outside in, and as an immigrant yourself, naturalized, I believe in 2013, you became an American citizen. Yeah. What has that experience of looking at this country from the outside taught you about what it means to be an American in 2018 and our current political moment? I think America, without a doubt, is the most giving country in the history of mankind. One of the reasons I'm so proud that we came America. Hey. Don't take that personally. <laughs> I want my extra two minutes, please. <laughs> the president is interrupting my talk. <laughs> this is a test of the national wireless emergency alert system. No action is needed. Okay, people, come back to us. Come back to us. Put your phones down. It's no alert. It's no alert. There we go. On that note. You know what? As an immigrant, I saw that immigrants like me, we build bridges. We made sure that people recognize that people that look different than us, different accent, different, different religion, skin color, hair color, the way we look. Uh, it seems sometimes the system makes us believe that we should be afraid of those. When actually it's all the contrary. By knowing all the people that are different like you, you are enriching yourself. You know one of the reasons I really love to go to places like Haiti or just Guatemala that we were there after the volcano and we did almost 400,000 meals. You know in this moment that seems some people want to be building walls. Such a brilliant idea to build a wall, right? You think if you build a wall, you are protecting your people from harm. Every single civilization that kind of put themselves behind a castle or behind a wall, if you look, they've disappeared from the history of, of Earth. They are not here anymore. History proves that. Walls don't protect civilizations from disappear. What's the best walls America can be building? When we went to Guatemala and we began feeding the people in need after the volcano, we were making sure that they will come back from the tragedy of the volcano, of the lives that were lost, of the homes that they lost. By feeding them and helping them restart their lives, we were making sure that they will be happy in the country they belong, in the communities they want to be. If we don't provide them with anything, what are they gonna do? What would you do if your children have no food tomorrow? You will go to the end of earth to feed your children. If we build walls, we will not protect America from, from a, a future of, of, of chaos. If we invest in making sure the communities that surround America do as well as we are trying to do for ourselves, that's the way we will have a safer America. <laughs> the, best wall, the best money America can do it's investing in USAID and making sure that every country around the world does better. That's the safety of America. It's a very simple solution. Chef Jose Andres, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it.